Hello everyone, and thank you for joining us today for another Cyborg Security Threat Hunt Deep Dive. My name is Lee Arkinall, and today we'll be talking about the Windows native binary ascentutil.exe. I'll be covering its capabilities, how it's being abused in the wild, I'm going to give a quick demonstration in the lab, and then we're going to go on a hunt to find these behaviors. I hope you enjoy. Being a Windows native binary, it's no surprise that we can find ascentutil in the Windows System 32 or Windows SysWile 64 directory. What a set util is used for is to perform multiple operations on databases and database files. Here are the flags that you can use to perform these operations in the command line interface. And for more information, please check out the Ascent Util Microsoft Docs listed below. Now I'm sure there's more, and you can probably find some on your own. But here I have two good examples of a set util being abused in the wild. And the first comes to us from the dfirreport.com. In a report published August 1st, Looking at the command line arguments, we can see the threat actor was executing a sent util against a .edb file using the slash p flag. What this signifies is that the actor was trying to repair the .edb file. Now the second example comes to us from Red Canary's Twitter account, where they documented a sent util interacting with the web cache directory. There's a file in this directory named webcachev01.dat which contains information from Internet Explorer and Microsoft Edge and could contain credentials. Here are some techniques documented by the MITRE ATT&CK matrix that are associated with the sent util abuse. I'll be demonstrating ingress tool transfer as well as OS credential dumping, where we'll dump the ntds.dit file, move it to a Kali Linux box, and extract credential information. I'm going to complete the following tasks to successfully abuse a sent util. I'm going to add and extract contents to the alternate data stream. I'm also going to run an executable from this location, and I'll use a sent util to extract the ntds.dit file from the C Windows ntds directory. Later on, we're going to move that file to a Kali box, and we're going to use a Python script called secrets dump to extract hash information. So what are alternate data streams anyways? Basically, they're a file attribute within the NTFS file system that can be modified to hide data. I'll be demonstrating this in the lab, and you'll see whenever I hide data within the file, a normal user would not be able to detect it. So what is the ntds.dit file? It's a file that contains a lot of information about the active directory within the environment. More importantly, it has user credentials and passwords within it. All right, so the death by PowerPoint portion is over. So if you've stuck with me this far, thank you very much, and let's get to the live demonstration. Hi, and welcome to the lab. Before we start abusing a send util, I want to show you how we can hide information in the alternate data streams of a simple text document. The first thing we're going to do is create the document with a message in it. Then we're going to hide other text inside the alternate data streams. And then we're going to extract it and show you what it looks like from a user's perspective. So we're going to start by issuing a simple echo command with some text to create the document on our desktop. Now after we issue it, we can open up the file, and as you can see, there's nothing suspicious about it. As of now, it's not a suspicious document. But if we want to hide information in the alternate data streams, we have to point it there. So I'm going to run another echo command, but instead of pointing it at test.txt, I'm going to point it at one of the alternate data streams. Okay, so another file was not created, which is what we wanted. And if we click on test.txt, it still looks the same. But because we know that we've hidden something within the alternate data streams of this text document, there is a way that we can open up the document using Notepad and reveal the hidden text. We just run a notepad.exe test.txt with a colon of the hidden text. And then, there you have it. So you may be saying, well, that doesn't really help me very much because I know I hid the text there, so that's where I'm going to look. How can I find it without knowing it's there? Well, using the following command in PowerShell, we can use the get item, aim at the directory that we want, and use the streams flag with a wildcard to capture all the stream data that we can look at. Now you can see that we have four test files on the desktop, and we're going to look at all of those. 
So we got a lot of data here. Um, as you can see, the recurring uh, theme is the dollar assigned data, but our first text text file is the only one with the um, the actual hidden text within it. Well, now that we know that that's different and special, we can run another command called git content of that file, and we can aim it at the stream that we want, which is hidden.txt. And there's the content itself. So now we know how to find it within PowerShell and how to extract the hidden text or information. Now in this instance, it's a very easy plain text message. Um, attackers will like likely hide in encoded PowerShell commands or executables or stuff that we can't even read to make it harder on defenders. Uh, but this is a simple way to find hidden streams uh, through PowerShell. Before we extract the file itself, um, I want you to recall earlier in the video where I ran the get content command and we were able to see uh, the plain text message that said this is hidden text. Well, the ntds.dit file isn't readable uh, by Notepad um, or PowerShell itself. So if we run the get content uh, command again, this is what we get. Now, this is something that you might see um, if an adversary tries to obfuscate or run encoded commands or hide something, even you know non-plain text. So we're gonna stop this though, but um, this is what it'll look like. Uh, so if you find something like this, be aware that you might be onto something. The last thing we need to do is launch an executable from an alternate data stream. Now I may have misspoke or misled you earlier in the video, but AscentUtil does not have the capability to launch or execute an executable or a bat or ps1 file um, it just doesn't it just doesn't do that remember ascentutil its main operations are working on databases and database files and fixing and recovering those um, so we're gonna have to use a powershell command and but you'll still see it in action um, so at first we uh, took a well-known executable named process explorer which is part of this uh, windows sys internal suite and we've hit it in um, it in test.txt um, and now we're gonna execute it. So we're using an info command from PowerShell and we're targeting the alternate data stream. We hit go. It creates a process. Um, you see the process ID. And if we wait a little bit, there it is. Um, so we have successfully run an executable um, that was hidden within an alternate data stream. Now that we know all these techniques, um, now it's time to hunt for them. So next time I see you, we'll be in the lab and uh, using our sim tools. So welcome to the threat hunting portion of the video. Um, what I'm going to show you is three queries all looking for a scent util activity, but in different ways. Um, the first query we're going to use is it going to be very general. And it's going to cast a broad net looking for um, almost you know any scent util activity. Um, and this is going to be our hunt. Um, the second query you're going to see is going to be a little more um, specific, but not something that you will do to create a detection or a alert, because um, it still might return a lot of false positives. Um, and then the third one is going to be looking for a very specific activity um, and behaviors associated with the sent util, and that's going to be looking for the ntds.dit file being dumped from a uh, volume shadow copy. Now, the logic behind this is um, hunting and detections. The, the big difference is if you have a detection in your system that, or an alert that's going to trigger when activity happens, you've almost already narrowed it down to a certain criteria being met, and that is known bad. Um, you don't want to set up a bunch of alerts or detections in your environment that uh, have a ton of false positives because that's just going to um, waste the time of your investigators. Um, so you start with a hunt, which is a general hypothesis of what you think uh, is bad behavior. Um, you start hunting um, and you expect false positives to occur. Um, and then as you work through the false positives, that's when you can take your results and create a detection or alert where you say, if we see this and this, we know it's known good. Um, but if you see this, it's known bad. Um, for example, if you're looking at users, um, you know, you find Bob is running a sent util all the time, but he's a database administrator and you, you talk to him and investigate and that falls in line with his tasks, which makes sense. Um, being a sent util, you know, it works on databases and database files. Um, but if you see Steve from HR uh, running a bunch of sent util commands, 
you know, that could be a red flag. Um, and once again, you would then take those false positives, document them, and then possibly be able to create a detection alert. Um, so looking at our first query, and by the way, we're gonna provide all the queries, um, the commands, and the references that I used to build this video in the description of the video so that you can have it. And we're gonna take the queries and we're gonna kind of change them and transform them uh, to a base logic where you'll have the variables, um, but you know not everyone uses Splunk. So you'll be able to take the variables and the values and move them into your environment and drop them in where you need to or the fields that you're using and be successful uh, with this hunt. So looking at our first query, we see we're looking at event code 4688, which is Windows uh, process create ID. Um, then specifically, we're looking in the process command line for certain flags and the process name being a sent util. Uh, if you recall during the demonstration, we used slash y to copy a file, we used colon to hide stuff in the alternate data streams, and then the slash d um, is to defrag the file and make it smaller, more compact. Um, but we're gonna run this hunt and we're gonna see what we get. Now, knowing what we did, um, and if you recall from the demonstration, there wasn't a lot of legitimate activity um, we were being malicious, but we should still capture most of it. Um, and as you can see in the results, um, we can see where we took Process Explorer and hit it in the uh, alternate data stream of a text document. Um, recall also that we used a PowerShell uh, command to uh, execute that. We didn't use a send util. Um, and then looking at the results from the DC in our lab, uh, you can see that we dumped the ntbs.dit file um, accessing the volume shadow copy. Um, we hit it in a test uh, doc or text document, uh, its alternate data streams, and then later on we extracted it. So with this hunt, we were able to identify all the malicious activity that we conducted. Um, and once again, lab environment, so this, not, uh, this may not reflect real time, but we were still able to capture all of it. Um, so let's move on to our uh, next query. So here we are at our second query. Um, and once again, it's still more considered a hunt, um, but you can easily add to the query and add your variables that you find, the false positives that you find to the query to reduce the amount of false positives. Um, but what we're looking at now is same, pro uh, same event ID, which is 4688. We're looking at the process command line with some flags associated with the sent util and uh, sent util itself. But we've also added uh, some command line arguments that are looking in certain directories. Now, what this enables you to do is if you find that the uh, procedures in your environment have a specific place for database files, or there are specific database locate or database file locations in certain directories on servers, um, you can add them into the process command line as a not. Um, and what this is, what the intent of this hunt is to look for abnormal locations. Um, being a lab, you know, we're not really conducting real life um, operations. So I've thrown in some variables that will uh, reflect that might be um, a little abnormal. For example, if we had the ntbs.dit uh, file in app data, that would seem weird um, and possibly malicious because first of all, why is it there? Um, and it could be indicative of a threat actor copying the NTBS dit file and moving it somewhere else um, throughout the systems or throughout the machine. Um, so once again, take these queries, tweak them as needed. Um, as you can see, the results are the same as the first query, um, but a little more targeted. Um, you know, we expanded on the hunt, we took the net, we shrunk it a little bit more. Um, you know, and like I said, if you have a bunch of false positives, you can add them as not logic operators um, and that will reduce the noise. Um, and on, on to our third and final query. For our final query, this is the one that you could set up as a detection or an alert. Um, it is very specific in what it's looking for and it's very specific in the behaviors um, that are associated with this type of activity. So event code 4688, which is process create again. But if you look at the process command line arguments, you see we've added an and. So it is specifically looking for 
slash vss and slash or an ntds dot dit file being in the command line argument. Um, whereas earlier it was more of an or, so it was kind of looking for anything. This is specifically looking for processes being created with these values in the command line triggered by a sent new fill. Um, and if you recall from the demonstration, we know we did this, so, so we should be able to uh, find it. Um, the only difference you see is that we've returned a specific event versus the other queries returned all of our events or multiple events. Um, so this is something you could set up in your environment uh, as the detection and the alert and know that you know, there's a very small chance of this being a false positive. All right, so I know it was short, but this was our uh, threat hunting portion of it. Um, always remember, uh, as an investigator, pivot, pivot, pivot. Um, the results you get back um, is just the tip of the iceberg, and it's not the be-all, end-all, and the solution. Um, you, know, you can pivot off of host name, username, um, and dig. Keep questioning, you know, why is this happening? And if you stick around, um, I'm actually going to have a bonus section where I'm going to take the ntds.dit file and show you what can be done from an attacker's perspective um, where you know, we, we're going to reveal the information within it um, and we're going to try and crack it. So welcome to the bonus section of this video. Um, the reason this is more of a bonus is because all the activity you're going to see here is off your network um, and from the perspective of the, of the attacker. Um, so you, unless they do this on your network, which would be probably not the smartest thing to do, um, you know, you won't be able to detect any of this because it's not your machine. Um, but this is going to show the importance of building detections around the ntds.dit file or building um, detections around that type of activity. Um, once again, the ntds.dit file has username and password hashes in it. Um, and, but there are tools out there that can crack those things. Um, so we're going to start with a Python script called Secrets Dump. And what that's going to do is we're going to run it, and you're going to see everything that's within the ntds.dit file. So let's get that going. So once the Python script is finished running, um, we have our output. Here's where we can start looking around and seeing what information that we can uh, get from it. Um, so looking through the data, we see dirtylab.local and we see a username Victor Stone. Uh, if you recall or noticed from the demonstration, that's actually who we were uh, when we were on the DC. Um, and you scroll down and you see some more uh, domain usernames. Um, but from here, the next step would be to um, take the username, extract it, and then extract the NTL and hash with it and um, put in a file. And the goal would be to extract that or crack that hash so that we could get the um, clear text password. There's something else you could do uh, as well as you can use another Python script uh, called psexec. Now it's not the psexec.exe that we're used to on Windows or you may be used to, um, but it does the same thing. There is a pass the hash uh, capability where all you need to do is identify which computer you're, uh, you're going to connect to what the username is, and what hash you have, and then that's a way to uh, privilege escalate. Uh, so once again, the ntds.dit file has a lot of information in it, um, and really, if an attacker gets it, they can get keys to the kingdom. Um, and all the, remember, all this part is um, non-detectable because it's offline on their network. Um, and once again, stressing the importance of creating detections, creating alerts, creating um, any content that you can around uh, really valuable things like this. Well, thank you very much for joining me. Um, it's been a really big pleasure of mine to create this video and I hope you enjoyed this uh, video and I hope that you learned a lot. Um, I love doing things like this and I'm going to try and do it more often, um, but for now, I'll see you on the next one. Take it easy.